Hi, I'm Minister Williams, and welcome to the Kingdom of Heaven Ministries Total Loving Care Perfecting Class. I will be your video instructor for this lesson. This lesson is number seven, The Promise of Natural and Spiritual Prosperity. We got a lot to cover, so let's get busy. All right, The Promise of Natural and Spiritual Prosperity. This is lesson number seven. The lesson objective is to provide a brief introduction to the relationship of righteousness and to the promise of natural and spiritual prosperity. How righteousness produces natural and spiritual prosperity. Letter A, what is righteousness? God has something in his heart concerning me. He said it out of his mouth. It became a reality in his world. I say out of my mouth and believe in my heart what God said concerning me, and it becomes a reality in my world. Righteousness is an established lifestyle based upon an inherent transformation which creates outward manifestations that reflect His presence. So what is prosperity? Prosperity is living a fulfilled life with all of your spiritual needs, emotional needs, and natural needs met in abundance. Now, a lot of times people will think, and this is probably per pervasive over the uh, Christian community, that prosperity just means money. But it's not just money. If you see in this definition here, it's your spiritual needs, your emotional needs, and your natural needs met in abundance. God wants you to be prosperous. So we're going to look at some scriptures here and give you some definitions of prosperity. Uh, we're going to go over this acrostic and maybe some reasons why people aren't being as, prosperity, as prosperous as they should be. And uh, hopefully answer some of your questions so that you can be spiritually, emotionally, and naturally prosperous in your life. So let's look at some, some points first of why people are not prosperous. Number one, and, and we're going to look at page, actually, not the second page, but the third page, which is point number three. And it says, facing the controversy in the Christian community. Number one reason I believe people aren't prosperous because of lack of, of, a lack of knowledge. If we look at Hosea 4 and 6, it says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be of no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. So if you notice here, it says a lack of knowledge. Knowledge is one of the things that we have to have if we're going to be prosperous in any arena, any area of our life. We've got to have knowledge. You go to school, you went to high school, you did all of that to gain knowledge so that you could graduate and possibly get a job or whatever. But it's, it's the knowledge that you don't have that's really hurt you. So we want to look again at this. And I want to point out maybe some points that people uh, 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 help to miscrew about this uh, prosperity business. Notice that people aren't prosperous because sometimes the people that you hang around with don't want you to be prosperous. You know that old saying, that crab barrel mentality where one crab almost gets out the barrel, the other one pulls him down? People generally don't want you to advance. I remember when I was going to college and telling folks I was going to college, they said, oh, you're going to get educated. <laughs> That's the word that they use. But they, they, they feared me getting educated because I would be at a different level that they were. And sometimes the people that you hang around with, they just don't want you to be prosperous. If you get a little bit more money, they want, they want to have it. If you work for it, they certainly want you to give it to them so they can be on the same level that you are. But you need to, to know that hanging around those type of people will not help you to be prosperous. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you got to be around prosperous people who believe God and believe that they can be prosperous and know how to do it. So get around people uh, and get away from those people that want you to, to not be any higher than they are. Find some people that want to encourage you and get you to, and encourage you to be blessed. Those are the people that you want to hang around with. Another thing that keeps us from being prosperous is wrong teaching. You know, we've heard in the, uh, in the religious world how people just uh, say that we need to be poor and humble and how Jesus was poor. He didn't have a house and didn't have a room or anything like that, but he came as a king. And Jesus as a king had everything. If you notice when he was born, the wise men came and gave him gifts, gold, mirth, and like that, he was prosperous in everything he did. In fact, when he was with the disciples, he had enough to feed over 5,000 people. So you can't do that 
not being prosperous. He was prosperous in his knowledge. He could answer all those hard questions that the Pharisees and Sadducees tried to trap him with. He just had his spiritual needs met. He had his natural needs met. He wasn't poor about anything. Uh, he even had a fresh donkey to ride when, when he went into uh, Jerusalem. He had a brand new one. So he, had, he was prosperous in every area of his life, and that's the way God wants you to be. You know, a king wants to have his citizens, uh, or make his citizens look prosperous because that gives glory to the king. So since he was a king, he wants us to be just as prosperous as he is. And of course, we're the king's kids, we're his children. So he don't want us to be uh, poor in any area of our lives. So wrong teaching, get away from that wrong teaching. The other thing is, and this is probably one of the biggest things, is just bad management of all the resources we have. That's time, talent, and treasure, our money. You know, prayers are not answered simply because you ask God. He wants to see if you can manage what you're asking for. He answers prayers to people who can manage their resources, their time, their uh, t uh, talent, and their money. And I think the biggest mismanagement of, of, that we have is time. We have a lot of time to do everything. Do you know there's 24 hours in a day? And since God wants 10% of everything that we have, because he's the owner of everything we have, that means two hours and 40 minutes are his. So what are you doing with your time? You can't say, I don't have time enough to pray, because he's giving you, uh, or you have two hours and 40 minutes that's actually his to pray. So what are you doing with your time? Are you playing Xbox? Are you watching TV? What are you doing? Are you just laying around and you're in the bed too long? You know, idle hands will make you poor. So you have to, to get into a mode that I'm going to use my time wisely. And then what about your talent, your giftings? How are you using them? You know, if you want to graduate from college, you have to go to school. And then when you get, go to school, naturally you have to bring the lessons home. You got to study. You got to make time to do that if you want to prosper in that. Remember we said in every area of your life. So what are you doing with your talent? And then of course, how are you spending your money? Now that's not our business how you spend it, but it is a resource and God is, wants you to be responsible. He tells us to be good stewards of the things that uh, are the resources that we have from him. So what are you doing? Are you tithing? Are you giving? And we're going to look at that a little bit later because that's God's program or system for us to prosper. That's one of the ways that we do it. But what are you doing with your time, talent, and your treasure? Are you using the resources that God has given you? And I think the mismanagement of them keeps us from being prosperous. And the last thing is, uh, number four of the things that I'm thinking about is that some people just don't believe that God will uh, produce for them, that he'll make them prosperous. That is not for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those that's blessed to be rich. Well, if you ever read, if you ever known a, a rich man, they don't get prosperous just by believing that, hey, it's going to come out of the sky. Or, you know, you can make those confessions, you know, money coming to me now. How long we've been saying that and still don't have money. They work for it. You know, miracles are great, but miracles don't produce what you can work for. In fact, I think a lot of religious people depend on miracles because they're basically lazy. If you want to be prosperous in every area of your life, you got to go to work. Let's say I want to lose weight. Well, I got to stop eating so much. I got to get on a diet. If I want to get my bills paid, I got to get on a budget. I got to figure out a budget for me. Um, if I want more friends, I got to first become friendly. I got to get out there and, and maybe volunteer, get on a staff or on a branch and, and make friends that way. You got to do something to be prosperous. You just can't believe that God is just going to drop this thing out of the sky uh, to you to be prosperous. He's, if he brought money out of the sky, you'd be uh, labeled as a counterfeiter because money doesn't come that way. So we, we need to get to work. And I believe some of these things are the reasons why that we're not prosperous. So, of course, a, a lack of knowledge, Hosea 4 and 6. And, um, and I, I just jot these, these scriptures down. We won't look them up. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6. Also Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. And also uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And you see how a, a lack of knowledge has really hurt us. In fact, in these scriptures, you'll see in this one here in Hosea, let's go back here to our, our lesson here. And Hosea says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because that they have rejected knowledge. Sometimes you can have knowledge, it's out there, 
but you reject it. Now, how do we reject knowledge? Well, there may be books out there that maybe you're starting a business and you need a, a business plan, and there's books out there that authors have uh, produced to help you to, to start a business plan. But you reject it because you won't buy the book. Oh, that's too much. That $10 is too much. Well, you got to invest in your future. You know, over in Ecclesiastes, it says that we'll be reading many books to become a weariness to the soul. But you got to read it for it to become a weariness to your soul. So sometimes when we go to conferences and stuff like that, we don't want to buy the materials. We'll pass right by the materials. We're rejecting the knowledge that God has made available to us through people who have been there and done that. And they want to show you how to be prosperous. If you want to exercise, there's plenty of exercise books out there. If you want to be prosperous in your cooking, there's many cooking books. You probably have some on your shelves, but you never read them. You rejected knowledge. So that's one of the things I really believe that, that will hurt us. The next thing here in letter B, it says extremes are not the norm. Everybody will not be a millionaire. Mark 4 and 20. Let's, let's read that together. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty and some a hundred. Matthew nine twenty nine says, then touch he their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. Some people don't have that faith. And again, I really believe that they're violating the principle of management. If God was to give you just drop on you a, a million dollars, you'd probably be broke maybe within a year because of mismanagement. You rejected the knowledge of how to take that money and invest it and help it, help it to grow or work for you. You know, you shouldn't have to work for money. Money should work for you. But because you have rejected that knowledge, uh, everybody's not going to be a millionaire. Those people that are millionaires, they're going to hang around millionaires. They find out what the secrets are that they have. Well, how do they get to be a millionaire? Uh, they read books and um, they look at maybe programs that, sh that show them how to be a millionaire. They're not just playing Xbox or looking at the soap operas all day long. They're trying to get the information that will say uh, that will show them how to be millionaires. So because we je we reject knowledge and we don't want it, then uh, sometimes we just we we just find ourselves begging or wanting God to produce a miracle for us, and uh, it just won't help. It just won't happen that way. Uh, sometimes religious people just think that their tears and their emotions will move God to give them what they want. Well, he's not that kind of God. The kind of God he is is, I'm going to give you what you ask for if you can manage me. manage it. And we see that even in the first book when he gave Adam the assignment of taking care of the garden. He didn't let anything grow. I believe that's um, Genesis 2 and 6. He didn't let anything grow until he had a man on earth to manage it. And he told him to keep it and to take care of it and to cultivate it. So in order for us to be prosperous, we got to cultivate some things. So now let's look at this definition of prosperity. And hopefully I kind of stirred you, uh, stirred in your mind some reasons why people aren't prosperous. <clears throat> prosperity is living, again, a fulfilled life. Notice it says a fulfilled life, a life that's full. With all of your spiritual needs, your emotional needs, and your natural needs met in abundance. You know, you can not be really prosperous if your emotional needs are not met. You can't really be prosperous if your physical needs are not met, especially if your spiritual needs are not met. So prosperity is all of these things that you need. So now in the words of a different light, which Pastor Brown has, has written, and the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Ghost has given us these principles, I want you to look at uh, this prosperity. It's on the right side of your page here. And let's read it together. What is prosperity? Prosperity is having plenty of resources, opportunities, surplus, provision, and extravagance received to implement a transition to your next assignment. So it's having plenty of resources. You know, that's why we want prosperity. We need to have resources. Now, why does it say resources? Because God doesn't, doesn't give you prosperity just to spend on yourself. He always gives you plenty of resources, opportunities, and surplus so you can help somebody else. He wants you to serve someone else. All right. Provision. You need provision and extravagance. You know, in the Christian community, sometimes in the religious community, I should say, they don't want you to have extravagance. They say, you know, if I have too much, then I'll forget God. Well, you shouldn't have too much to forget God because he's the one who gave it to you. Remember the rich young ruler? Yeah, he came to Jesus. He said, what must I do to be saved? He said, well, sell all you have. He said, first of all, keep my commandments. He's responded by saying, I've done that since my youth. 
I believe that's how he got prosperous. But then something happened. The money had him instead of him having the money or the prosperity. So Jesus says, sell all you have. Give to the poor, come and follow me. And he walked away sad. And he said, how uh, it's not easy for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's not easy for that man that's prosperous to trust in his prosperity and not into the in word and in the Lord. And since Jesus is the owner of everything, then uh, he couldn't give it up. He couldn't get that money up. He didn't. He saw the riches. He saw himself as being the source of his riches instead of God being the source of his riches. So, again, there's plenty of resources, opportunities. You know, when you have a lot of, of uh, surplus, you have a lot of opportunities to give. A lot of people, a lot of doors will open up for you because of the resources that you have. You know, here in Michigan, Mr. Mott had a lot of resources. So sometimes when we want something um, that uh, he can give us, we'll go to him or to his family, uh, the Mott Foundation. And, and they, will <clears throat> they will fund us in whatever we are desiring to uh, put together. And it's only, they can only fund us because they have plenty of resources. They have surplus and provision. <clears throat> of course, they have extravagance too. And we could have that. Let's look at this definition. It is the provision that grants you the profusion necessary for promotion and more effective production for vision development and fulfillment. There's three keys to prosperity, profusion, or affluence. That means having plenty of, plenty of money. The next one is plenty. You have an abundance. And then the last one, you have possessions or assets. So you can't help anybody if you don't have a lot, not a, uh, assets. If I needed ten dollars and all you had was two, you couldn't really help me. But if you have an abundance, you know, if you have a hundred dollars and I ask for ten, that's no problem for you. And you have not only enough for me, but you have enough to give to somebody else if they needed ten dollars or twenty dollars or whatever, all the way up to a hundred. <laughs> all right. So let's look at page uh, point number two: understanding God's will for the believer's prosperity. God wants us to be prosperous. He doesn't want us to be poor. Again. He's a king, and his kingdom reflects the prosperity that he has. And so he wants to uh, have his people reflect also that prosperity. So he wants you to be prosperous. Don't listen to the lies of the devil, and don't listen to that religious community that says, you know, we need to be poor and humble, and that's how and all we want to do is make it to heaven. No, he wants you to be prosperous. He wants you to have heaven here on earth. So let's look at this. This is point number two, letter A. God's will is found in scriptures and is obtained by four things. First thing is meditation. And we want to look at that. And actually, before I do that, though, I want to go back to this uh, management point because it's very important. Uh, in words of a different light again, and this is not on your sheet, but manage is, to, is maintaining advancement by not permitting anything to stop growth and expansion. You don't let anything stop your growth and expansion. Manage is bringing about by specific actions tailored to produce a, desi a desired end for the expansion of the kingdom of God and for experiencing the enjoyment of a kingdom lifestyle. So it's a bringing about. It's bringing about by specific actions tailored to produce. You, you see, you can't be lazy in this thing. You got to go to work. Go to work and find out what it is that, that what I have to do or what the Holy Spirit has given me to be prosperous in whatever area. Again, if it's my spiritual area, if it's my natural, my body, if it's a household, if it's money, whatever it is, I have to go to work to do it. He's given you a brain. He's given you a mind. He's given you his word. Go to work. Okay. Three laws to manage is administer, govern, and that's what Adam did. Activate, set in motion. You can't set in motion standing still waiting for God to drop it out of heaven. You got to do something. And advance, move forward. You got to move. Okay? All right. Let's, let's go on here with this lesson. I, and, and we want to look at this uh, thing about med, uh, meditation. I want to go back down here in the words of a different light and uh, look up um, meditate and give you the, uh, the uh, uh, words in a different light for meditate. That's the first thing. It's in Joshua 1 and 8, so let's look at the scripture first. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So notice the first thing 
he says, is that this law should not depart out of your mouth. So the promises of God, the word of God, got to come out of your mouth. Remember, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So this meditation is going to help you to uh, re um, regurgitate the promises that you're believing for to help you to be prosperous. All right. So what is meditation? It's just reflective thinking. You know, it keeps you to um, focus on, uh, the, on the right thoughts that you may produce, the right actions. All right. So let's look at this in words of a different light again. And this is the word meditate. Meditate is musing. That's thinking about, you know, like the opposite of meditation is worry, the worldly part of it. And, you know, when you worry, you're always thinking about a bill that you got to pay, how you're going to pay it and like that. Well, when we do the word and use meditating on the word, it's not worrying. It's meditation. And meditation is musing. You're thinking about the word. You, you, you're using your imagination to see yourself prosperous in whatever area that you're uh, desiring to be. So it's musing, it's examining, it's dreaming and imagining thoroughly all possible thoughts before execution. So you're thinking about all this stuff. You're thinking about this word of God and you're trying to get a lifestyle image. Remember, believe. You're starting to believe this thing. It's building a lifestyle image, an eternal lifestyle image through your imagination. And you're imagining thoroughly all possible thoughts before you execute. That's planning. You got to plan. But first, you got to have something to plan. That's why you meditate on this word or on the promise. So meditate is imagining and pondering on the required details and directions for successful execution in the expansion of the kingdom of God and for experiencing and enjoyment of a kingdom lifestyle. You know, before we had GPSs, we used to travel if we was going somewhere, we use a road map. And you get the map out and you look at it and you find out and you look and you find out and you try to discover what's the best route for you to take that you're going to uh, use to get to wherever your des designation is. Excuse me, destination is. And so what you want to do is you do the same thing. You look at it you imagine yourself going, you ponder, okay, which is the best way, what highway should I take? Man, you're trying to get all the details and the directions before you move because you want to know where you're going. So you do all of this before, not after, but before. So this is what meditation is, man. You get that thought in your mind, whatever it is, you know. For instance, if you need healing, maybe you look at 2 Peter 2.24, 1 Peter 2.24, and you said, by his stripes, I'm healed. So you see yourself healed. You see yourself doing the things that you couldn't do before. You're meditating on it. Okay, there are four laws in meditation. Number one is receiving. You got to read. Number two is registering. Memorization. So once you get the promise, you got to memorize it. See, this is all work. Then you reflect. You make that thing personal. See, you, you get that scripture and you put your name in it. You see yourself in there, in that scripture. You see yourself... Uh, being fulfilled in the promise that God has given you. Then you realize, you visu visualize and you imagine. You, you, I mean, you're there. You're there. I mean, when I was uh, um, sick uh, with this sarcoidosis, man, I could see, I couldn't play golf. And you guys know that I like to play golf. But I saw myself playing golf. I saw myself walking, uh, pain-free. You got to see yourself there. That's part of meditation. Okay, again, we looked at First Joshua 1 and 8. Let's look at Psalms 1 and 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, in verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doeth he meditate day and night. Remember one of the roadblocks I told you to from prosperity is hanging around people that don't believe that you should be prosperous. So here he says, don't stand in the way of those people. Get away from them. But have your delight in the law of the Lord, because this, this word is true, and it's going to come to pass if you work it. you got to work it, okay? So that's the first step, meditation. The second step is empowerment. In Deuteronomy 8, 18, it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto his fathers, as it is this day. Now, there's, there's some... Um, other scriptures that you can go to, Proverbs 10, 22, Psalms 1 and 2 and 1 through 9, and then Luke 5, 4 through 6. But I'm going to concentrate on just one. But thou shalt remember. Now, how do you remember? You remember by meditating. 
Remember? Memorization, meditating. Okay? But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he, who? God, that giveth thee power to get well. He's the one that gives you ideas, witty inventions, so that you can get well. So you can have all those areas in your life, physical, spiritual, financial, um, a social, all of those areas that you need to be prosperous in, it's him that gives you all of that. Okay? It's his word. It's his promise to us. He said, get you power to get wealth. Now, here's the important part. Here's the principle that you can't miss. That he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. The reason for your prosperity, again, is so that you can help others. It's never just for you. Now, you get a residual of that prosperity. But basically, it's for you to help others, because that's what God is interested in. He's interested in souls. Okay? So, the next one now, that's the empowerment part. The first one was meditation. This one's, second one is empowerment. The third one is obedience. Let's look at the book of Job, chapter 36, verse 11. And it's on the right side of your page. It says, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. There it is. The word prosperity right there. And it's based on if you obey him, if you meditate, if you believe uh, his empowerment and you, you, you got the right motivation to help others. He says, and I'm going to make you prosperous. He said, only if you obey me, though. So obedience is key. You know, how, how much time are you spending in prayer? How much time are you spending in the Word? Are you giving Him the 10%? Are you tithing? Are you giving? Are you doing the things that God has asked us to do to make us prosperous? Those are the things that's going to help us to get where we want to get, where we want to go. The next one, the first one again is meditation, empowerment, obedience. The next one is design. Do you know that you're designed to prosper? Third John 1 and 2. Beloved. I wish, or wishes pray, some, or I pray to God. That's what that means when it says I wish. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. Now, what's in your soul? Your mind, your will, and emotions. So all of those things have to be in line with God so that you can prosper. See, so you got to go to work. You got to do some things. Your mind doesn't prosper if you don't put anything in it. All right? All right, so now let's look at his plan. How do we prosper? And this is uh, number, point number four. We already dealt with point number three when I talked about um, those things that keep people from being prosperous. Let's look at number four. Giving is God's plan to bring in increase. Number four, letter A. Giving promises a faith entitlement to prosper through number one, tithing. That's Malachi 3.10. It says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there may not be room enough for you to receive. Now notice he says, Bring the tithes in the house so there will be meat in my mouth. Meat is provisions. It's surplus. See, he wants to have some provisions. Uh, just presenting this, giving you this outline, and making this... Uh, uh, um, this uh, uh, tape uh, to give to you. All that costs money. Somebody had to pay for the, for the camera. It's taking my time, my talent, my treasure to sit down for 45 minutes an hour and produce these lessons for you. So if we didn't have provision in the storehouse, then we did, wouldn't have provision to give to you. We wouldn't have surplus to give to you. See? So he says, let there be meat in my house. He says, improve me now. You know, we used to say in, in, when we was growing up, I double dog dare you. Well, double dog God, dare God to make you prosperous by bringing your tithes into the storehouse. Give to him. Rem remember, he said 10% of everything that you make, your increase is mine. Ten a tenth of it, it's mine. So those 24 hours that you have, remember, two hours and 40 minutes belong to God. Amen. All right. So prove me now. Here was said the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there will not be room enough for you to receive it. So tithing, we're designed to be, to be uh, uh, prosperous. Number two, another reason why you give is for ministry or ministerial support. Let's look at Philippians 4, 17 through 19. Not because I desire a gift, and this is Paul talking, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all in abound. I am full, having received of 
Ephra, Ephra, this guy's name, <laughs> the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. Verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So this guy, Epaphroditus, I believe how you say it, he gave some money to Paul being sent from the Philippians. So this last statement was his promise. He said, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. So his needs were supplied because he gave to Paul. So it's ministerial support. Paul was a, uh, an apostle. He was on a mission. Number three, missions. When you give, you help to support the missions of the church. Mark 10, uh, 29 through 30. And Jesus answered and said, verily, verily, I, or verily, I say unto you, there is no man that has left his house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and for the gospels, but he shall receive. Now notice it said, he shall receive. You won't receive this until after you do what, the, what 29 said. See? But, you shall, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Notice he didn't say 30, 60, but he said a hundredfold. If you leave all, you're going to receive all. Amen? He said uh, a hundredfold now in this time, you're going to receive houses, and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in this and the world and in the world to come eternal life. So when you leave all for him, guess what? The ultimate prize is eternal life. Missions. That's part of giving. When you give, you give to missions. You give to the people. That's why you need surplus. That's why you need excess so that you can give because people need. All right. Here's another reason for, for giving, debt reduction. Look at Matthew chapter 17, verse 24 through 27. And when they were come to Capernaum, they had received tribute money. Came, they, uh, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, thou, Doeth thou master pay tribute? In other words, taxes. He said, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? of their own children or of strangers. Peter saith unto him, of strangers. Peter saith unto him, then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea and cast a hook and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, take it and give it to them for me and for thee. Now notice debt reduction, it not only was for Jesus to pay these taxes, but also for the apostles, or, or at this time the disciples. So God's provision, again, not only supplies himself, he could have just took the, fish, the money and said, okay, go pay it for me and you, you go get your own. But when you have surplus and plenty of provision, you can take care of not only you, but all that are associated with you. And that's what Jesus was showing uh, Peter here. He said, I'm going to take care of all of you. I'm a king. I want to take care of my citizens. I'm going to take care of all of you. I chose you, so I'm going to take care of you. All right, number five, giving. Uh, concerns of vial and pay principle. Now, I want to give you a little distinction between a vial and, and a promise. A vial is always made to God, but a promise is made to man. You can break a promise and be forgiven, but you don't want to break a vial. If you break a vial, it could bring death. That's, that's what the penalty was in the Old Testament. If you broke the vial, then, you know, death was on your, could surely come your way. So let's look at Job here, 22. 22 to through 28. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up, thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir, and the stones of the brooks. Yes, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. Notice he said, plenty of silver, and plenty of gold. For then shall thou have thy delight in the Almighty, and shall lift up thy face unto God. So notice, when you are prosperous, when you have plenty and surplus, there's delight. You're happy. Man, when you can give, especially to others, you're happy. That's when your joy is full. When you can't give, that's when you're kind of sad and trying to figure out, how can I give? How can I be a blessing to someone? All right, let's look at this. Verse 27. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. And verse 28, thou shalt also decree a thing, 
and it shall be established unto thee, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. So here, prosperity comes when you pay or, or complete your vow to God. Man, be obedient to him. Give, and it shall be given to you, pressed down, shaken together. Men shall give unto your bosom. So if you want to be prosperous and you make a vow to him, make sure you pay it. Make sure you, you do what you say you're going to do. And all of these blessings here that we just read in Job will be yours. Now the last point, letter B, promise of prosperity is obtained by faith. Everything is done by faith. Philippians 4, 17 through 19, not because I desire a gift, but because I desire fruit that thou might abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Ephroditus, the things which were sent from you, the odor of sweet smell, the sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So everything that we do, how you get prosperity, it comes by faith. Faith is an action word. It's acting on what you believe. You have built up an eternal life-size image of what you want and how you're going to be prosperous. And so now God is obligated because, obligated because you believed him and because he promised prosperity to you. But you got to go to work. It's not going to come out of the sky. You got to get away from these, all this negativity that wants you not to be prosperous. Don't get into the, the crab barrel and be the one pulling down somebody else. And don't let them pull you down. Okay? And be a manager. Be a good steward, a manager of the resources, your time, talent, and treasure that God has given you. Then you shall make your way prosperous after you've meditated on this stuff and after you've done all this stuff, and then you'll have good success. Well, I pray victory in your life today. Thank you for being with us. Again, there's some questions at the end of this video. Uh, answer the questions. If you have any questions that uh, you may have concerning this lesson, of course, you can see myself. You can see Minister Miles, uh, Minister Moses Price, or even you can talk to my wife, Antoinette Williams, and we'll be glad to answer all your questions. You have a blessed day now in the Lord, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.